All right, guys, welcome to the show. Today on the show, I've actually got someone by the name of Tim Page. I uh, met Tim through a private group that I'm in, a forum uh, that's hosted by John Lee Dumas of the Entrepreneur on Fire. I uh, met Tim through the through the forum, and we decided to hook up. And Tim runs a blog called Awesome Clarity. Um, he's got a really interesting story about kind of how he's gotten into entrepreneurship. And uh, yeah, welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks, John. I'm pumped to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. So, do you want to, you know, kind of share your story and just talk a little bit about, you know, how you got started and how this whole, like, you know, your, um, your getting into entrepreneurship, kind of how that all started for you? Absolutely. Well, I think my story kind of mirrors a lot of other people's stories, but it has some odd twists to it. When, when I went to college, um, I went to college for journalism thinking that I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write for magazines and stuff like that. And then I got there and I started writing and I realized that I hated to write. So that wasn't really going to work out too well for me. Uh, but my entire life I've always played music. I've been in bands. And shortly after college, I met a bunch of dudes who were in another band that I had played you know, various shows with. And we talked about doing a band together and playing you know, music that we just felt was really fun and not worrying about what other people wanted us to play. So we started doing that. We started taking it really seriously. We ended up touring all over the country. And um, in that time, we've, we've, we did a lot of things. We were a band for seven years. We toured for probably five of the seven years. We got signed to a record label. We played the Vans Warp Tour three years in a row. We played Bamboozle, and we played on... Um, John, do you remember the show TRL on MTV? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we played a, a live acoustic song on TRL when that was still around. Um, so we did all of that stuff, and it was a blast. I mean, that was my dream come true, and we really got to live our dreams. And it came to a point where you get really tired. And being in a band, you kind of... When you're at a certain level, you live on nothing. You have no money. You have no food, and... Uh, so we were living on $5 a day per person. I was eating Taco Bell literally two to three meals a day and nothing else. If I was lucky enough to eat something else, it was because the venue bought us pizza, right? And in terms of you know, drinking, at the time I, I didn't drink at all. I didn't drink alcohol. So uh, we were so broke that we had the option of we could either spend our money on water, and that was food money, so we could either give us some food to buy water, or we could drink the uh, Red Bull and Monster and Rockstar that was given to us since we were endorsed by all those companies. So literally living on Taco Bell and Rockstar or Red Bull or Monster or whatever was the beverage of the day, and you know, getting no sleep and you know, not being able to pay bills. So it, we, we started to wind down. We realized it was time to kind of move on. I got engaged um, and since then got married and had a baby. And just kind of figured out, you know, I want to I want to do something that's going to provide a great life and a great future for my family, but I want to still do something that I'm passionate about. So I tried a lot of different things, man. I've done, you know, I, I went the multi-level marketing route for like two years and really hated it. And the thing that I settled on prior to what I'm doing now is I actually became a consultant for a vacuum, a door-to-door -door vacuum sales company. Yeah. Um, a lot of people know like Kirby. They yep. were yeah they were our direct competition so we were we were number two vacuum sales brand in in the country, um, and so you know I did that and I I worked with that company built that company from generating six figures all the way up to uh, multi millions of dollars, which was awesome we had a great time I was making six figures in personal income, the problem was I was working twelve to sixteen hour days six to seven days a week, and you know that's not really sustainable especially when you're trying to start a family and I started to realize that I was just not I wasn't gonna be the guy who you know is always at work and never has time for his kid I wasn't gonna miss my kids baseball games and you know musicals and whatever the heck he was gonna do I wasn't gonna miss that I wasn't gonna only be around you know for an hour a day and have my kid go I don't really know my dad you know and, and there's nothing wrong with that I think you know I, I'm sorry for the people that that have that situation I feel really bad for you but I wasn't gonna let that happen to my kids so I started to look into some ways to start businesses I one day I was watching TV this was kinda where I I made a big change is I was watching TV and somebody on a TV show said the words passive income and I was like what the hell is passive income like, that's <laughs> That's not a thing. So I googled the words passive income and 
Um, anybody in the internet marketing space probably knows that Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income site came up. And I started reading it and listening to his podcast, and, and I was like, this is amazing. Like, people can do this. People can make money online and just by starting websites and, you know, talking into a microphone. And obviously, I love to talk, so I wanted to do that. And so I started a podcast. The podcast was called The Awesome Podcast, which was a lot of fun. I had no idea what it was going to be. I just knew I was going to interview entrepreneurs and ask them how they did it and you know, if other people listened, great, but it was really for me to learn what they were doing. Yeah. And uh, so my first couple of guests, I had Dan uh, Andrews from the Lifestyle Business Podcast, which is now the Tropical MBA show. I had Pat Flynn from Smart Passive Income. I had John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire. Dan Miller from 48 Days to the Work You Love. And I had all these guys on the show and asked them a bunch of questions and never really could figure out what the show was about. So I was making this affiliate income, and it was fine, a couple hundred dollars a month, but it wasn't giving me freedom. And so finally one day I figured it out. I said, I, I need to, to really narrow it down. And so um, I, I talked to my business coach at the time, and, and we kind of narrowed down some things, and I figured out that the thing I was struggling with was clarity. You know, What did I really want? What did I want for myself? What did I want for my family? What did I want for my life? And why did I want it? And we talked it over and we talked it over for a long time and eventually I came to the conclusion that I wanted to teach other people how to do that. So I built a, a company called Awesome Clarity and it's basically a podcast. Um, it's mostly a podcast where I talk myself for a while about how to figure that out and figure out what you want with your life, whether it's to be a stay-at-home mom or dad or to start a business or you know build a career or whatever it is that you want to do uh, and figure out why you want that so that you can really go after it. Um, I, I have a couple of other businesses as well. I, I produce podcasts. That's the main source of my income uh, with a company called Authority Engine. And then I'm also a professional voiceover artist. So I do you know, podcast intros and outros. And I do uh, narration for eBooks and uh, you know, sales videos and stuff like that. So I do a lot of stuff. But really, everything was all about building a, a business that I could be really excited about that I could want to get up in the morning and you know run to my computer and do it, but I could do it from home so I could always be around my kid. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. I really like your story. I mean, obviously, um, you know, for me, I'm kind of like feeling like similar. Like it, your, your story just sounds so similar to mine. Like even when I started, I, you know, I, I started a blog and I kind of just put it out there with my own name and started blogging about all these different things and didn't really know what my focus was. And then I started a show under that name and then eventually was like, well, this doesn't make sense. And then I spent weeks to come up with Voices of Marketing, even though it's so simple. It took me such a long time to come up with that. And, it's funny. Uh, the, the simple stuff is, is usually the hardest because it makes the most sense. It's, it's so perfectly clear what it is. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I think that, that sometimes is the hardest. It, did take, it took me a long time to come up with Awesome Clarity. And it's, you know, the name isn't even that good. It's just, it's just what it is. It's Awesome Clarity. Yeah, I think it's good because it's also simple and easily remembered. I mean, if you were to say it over audio, it's easy for someone to go and type it in. I had uh, I had originally my my first show. I was using my own domain, and then I called my show the Testimonial Technique. And I actually still have some of that audio. I mean, the first like 13 episodes I did were under that name, and I just rebranded them to Voices of Marketing. But what I was trying to go after was I was sort of trying to brand this idea of you know, like a popularity thing by using that as a um, way to make this technique a popular thing. And then I was going to have people like hopefully like, you know, go read about this technique and then use this to help other people. But it didn't really like make any sense with the show. And it just, I don't know, the whole thing was confusing, even the guests. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I just like dropped the whole thing. I was trying to like follow this strategy and turn it into like a popular thing with the podcast, but it just wasn't working. So I I just want more mainstream with this brand, and you know. I, I th yeah, I think that's one of the the most important lessons that I ever learned in business was if you can't explain your company in one sentence, then nobody's gonna ever really understand what you're all about. It's gonna be really hard to break through, and that's that's really what I struggled with with the awesome podcast was people would ask like, "What's your show about?" and I would tell them, "Well." I talk about uh, entrepreneurship and fitness and uh, health and happiness 
and I have guests on the show, and they all talk about different stuff. You know, every guest is a little different, and you know, I teach people how to do affiliate marketing, and we also teach people. You know, so it's like it gets so confusing, and nobody knows what your show is about. That was that that was really a difficult thing for me to get past. Yeah, and I mean that's a, that's even the thing too. Like I noticed, you know, obviously you're you're kind of like it sounded like you interviewed a lot of these entrepreneurs. I know most of the names. Like I I haven't looked at a lot of their stuff, but I know um Dan Andrews. Like I've looked at his website. And um, you know Pat Flynn, I've interviewed, and you know I obviously I, I know John because I'm in his podcasters, uh, you know his Paradise group. Yeah. And uh, you know it's interesting because I follow someone uh, you may or may not know of him, but his name's Mike Thomas, and he has a show called Mike from Maine. And oh yeah, I've I've heard his show a few times. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and he he like focuses really really um, you know big on like basically these products that people release like he almost interviews strictly people who create products right and you know a lot of these people have like you know stuff over on the warrior forum or they're just generally releasing a lot of like internet marketing related products stuff that might make you money or increase you know help you with your business and it's just interesting because i went and used a platform that john recently talked about called helper reporter out yep and uh, i got I, I sent out an email out last week on that, and I got, I think I've gotten over 50 emails. Wow. That's and, pretty amazing. Yeah. I don't know if you've used it yet, but um, for anyone listening, it, you know, I'll give a real brief rundown, and, you know, because it's a really useful. I mean, you could use this, it doesn't have to be for podcasting. You can basically put an inquiry out, and this email goes out, like, I think it's three times a day. They say, I don't know if I get it that much, but they say they send it out two, three times a day. And it will have all these various categories, you know, general business, um, you know, entertainment. And there'll be these big companies, like you could see ABC News on there saying, well, we're looking for people that have stories about such and such that are really, you know. So all I did was I put out a story and said, well, I have a marketing show and I interview people and there might be a potential to be in a magazine I write for as well as my podcast, YouTube, blog, everything. So obviously it's super, you know, sounds really good. It's very general. And I got an unreal amount of responses. I even got a website called Voices.com. They do voiceovers. They want the CEO, you know, someone on behalf of the CEO is like, oh, yeah, your domain's similar. We'd love to have you interview our CEO. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm a, voice, I'm a Voices.com member. so. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, so they, they, they reached out to me, and they, you know, they, want me to, they want me to interview their CEO. And it's cool because, you know, that I've got people reaching out to me. So there's just... And I guess really my point to the whole conversation was like you can, um, you can really like get into different things. I just figured I my show would be more, um, you know, sharing success stories from people like such as yourself, where like you've gone from this band, you know, having success with your band, and now you're obviously, um, you know, starting up your own podcast, and you have all these other side gigs and different things you're doing online. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. You know, it's funny. Jamie Tardy from Eventual Millionaire. She's a good friend of mine. If you haven't checked out her show, definitely check it out. But she yeah. uh, she's the one that introduced me to uh, help a reporter out. That's how she got a lot of her initial millionaires on the show. Is she put out a, a thing, you know, saying that she wanted to interview millionaires. So that's yeah. cool. Yeah, no, I, I think I read that she had a guest post recently on um, Neil Patel, Neil Patel's oh, yeah. blog, Quick Sprout, and talked a lot about that in that post. That's great. But, um, I mean, I don't know, like, obviously this isn't really, like, super uh, marketing talk, but I really was, like, curious to hear more about, like, your, your experiences being in a band and kind of, like, that whole transition from, uh, you know, coming from the band and, like, in terms of, like, money and how that how that was affecting your, your life. And I'd really like to, I guess maybe if you could, like, elaborate more on that story or talk more about it. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's funny, too, because marketing, in, in terms of the band... It is one of the most difficult forms of marketing that there ever was, uh, especially now. I mean, there was a time where being in a band was a super unique thing, and you know there weren't you didn't have fifty thousand bands at every high school. You didn't have, you know, um, you didn't have a show every night. You know, where I where I live, I live in Syracuse, New York, which is not a big city by any means. It's a mid size to mid smallish city, and there's just about every night there's at least one concert going on. And so things are a little different now. So it's really hard to get noticed in all the noise. I mean, more than ever, people don't buy CDs. They download them. I'm one of them. Um, I, I try to buy the smaller bands, but I can't 
I can't say that I don't download many of them. Um, but you know, that's what people do. It's a different culture. People don't buy records anymore. They they download them. People go to shows, but you know, all your money comes from merch. And where do people hear about you? Well, you can market online, but there's you know a million bands. So yeah, I mean, I think being in a band is definitely marketing related and. Um, one thing that we we weren't very good at is we never got ahead of the ball with things. I mean, our initial following came from MySpace uh, because yeah. at that time, you know, MySpace was amazing for bands. Do you remember that? Yeah, I mean, I used to go. It's so funny because, and you'll know who they are. Um, and I mean, I'm sorry for anyone listening. You might be like totally clueless about some of these bands we start talking about, but. Um, you know, obviously, you're in a what they what a lot of folks would call like a pop punk band. I think your band is called Honor Bright. Am I yeah. right? Yep, yeah. that's right. So, I mean, they, you know, he was kind of you know, like you mentioned, you were in you know, you played the Vans Warped Tour, and a, a lot of like bands these days, they're kind of in these like subgenres of metal that come around and play these shows. I've gone, I didn't go this past year, but I went the three years prior, and um, there's just this huge wave of like these subgenres of metal coming around and. Um, for those of you who don't know, I don't think I've ever mentioned it on the show. I run a blog, I run a website that's mainly focused on these subgenres and you know hosting music videos and kind of create a little community site for uh, people who want to like you know discover new music. But um, where was I going with this? So what I was going to say is uh, there's a band that I remember going out and finding. I used to go on MySpace all the time and I would just listen to these bands like on the little music player they had on the site. And I remember listening to a demo of um, Asking Alexandria before they ever released an album. <laughs> and they had 5,000 people on their MySpace. And I was like, you know, this band's really good. They're going to do really well. And, like, you know, those guys have literally exploded onto the scene. Like, they're, you know, they just did a tour. Um, you know, everybody should know who this band is. Is Corn recently came to my, my town here in Massachusetts and Asking Alexandria opened for Corn. And I mean that's that something crazy? because you know that corn has been around, you know, since I was like 13 or something. You know? Yeah, man. Interesting story about asking Alexandria. If you um if you go to YouTube and you search for Honor Bright at Bamboozle, mm -hmm. um, we played at this big festival in New Jersey called Bamboozle, where there's you know huge bands and there's a, a just a ton of people there. Yeah. And um, if you watch the video of us, you can see the asking Alexandria guys on the side of the stage. Our our manager. Um, I mean, we're not a band anymore, but our manager is the same manager as Asking Alexandria. Um, his name is Devin. We share the same manager, and so we would always run into those guys, and it was so funny because we just we liked those guys. They liked us, but we never really related on any kind of level. Mm. But anytime we ran into them, it was like they were doing something ridiculous, and uh, and so we would just kind of <laughs> our manager would be like, "Yeah, the Asking Alexandria guys want to watch you, your set. Can they come up on?" We're like, "Yeah, we don't, you know, that's cool." And then of course we watch theirs. But super nice guys. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I th that's the thing. Like, I love going to these shows, and um, you know, I'll always talk to the bands and just kind of put something out there. I'll, I'll actually, I made little business cards I got for free through a, um, I don't know if you use the social media network. It's called Clout. I, I don't use Clout, but I, a lot of people are, are using it, and I probably need to get on it. But I'm, I'm always slow to adopt new uh, <laughs> new social media. Yeah, so from a, I'll, I'll kind of like twist this back, but with Clout, I mean, um, you basically sign up and they measure your social media and your engagement and things like that. So um, what Clout does is kind of a little perk, is they'll give you what they call perks, and they'll, they gave me a perk for some company to make like business cards for free. And all I had to nice. do was pay for shipping. So I was like, well, what do I do? So I just made business cards for Metalcore Kingdom. This is way before I had Voices of Marketing. And then I, when I go to shows, like if I were to go to Warp Tour and I saw someone standing around, I would give the bands with the cards and say, hey, I, I promote your music videos on my website. you know. And I've had some of the band members, like I had, I know Johnny Plague, who's the lead singer of a band, Winds of Plague, yep. he uh, tweeted out my, my site. Which is pretty cool. I'm sure he's got you know thousands and thousands of followers. Yeah, that's awesome. It's so funny. All these bands that I never knew and that I you know I met on tour or I some of them I never met. I just saw when we were on tour, and it's funny because um, you mentioned we're pop punk, and again for anybody listening that you know doesn't understand all this stuff, I, I apologize. But you know we played a very happy, upbeat, uh, fun kind of music. I guess 
if you were to think of a, a band that a lot of people would know, I guess you could compare it to kind of Green Day. I mean, we don't really sound like them. We didn't sound like them, but same kind of feeling. If you if you only kind of like mainstream stuff, that would be kind of the comparison. And all these bands that that we're talking about, like Winds of Plague and Asking Alexandria, they're you know they're screaming bands, super heavy, really loud, and they're in your <laughs> face and that kind of stuff. And we would always end up because of our management company, we would always end up on tours with these bands. So it would be like. I remember these discussions that we would have before the show would start, and we'd be like, okay, tonight, you know, we're playing with uh, with Our Last Night and Alisana and Vampires Everywhere, and, like, all these kids are here, like, they're wearing black makeup, and they're all wearing <laughs> black shirts and black pants, and, you know, we're like, you know, just, we're happy guys. We walk around with smiles on our face, so we always be like, all right, we got to play our, like, our heaviest quote unquote heaviest songs tonight, so we're going to play, like, this song because it's about, like, breakups and we're going to make sure that we, you know, jump around a little extra. And it was always funny. We found that on these tours, and this I'm going to relate this to business. See, I can always find a way to turn this around. Yeah. On, on, <laughs> when, when on these tours with these heavy bands, when we would go up there and we'd, like, try to be heavy and we'd headbang and we'd, you know, do flips into the crowd and stuff like that, we didn't get a great reaction. But we went up there and we did our, our fun pop punk thing and just kind of, you know, acted as we were. We got a great reception, and it would always be like the girlfriend of the heavy metal kid at the show who would come up to us and buy all of our shirts and be like, I thought I was going to hate this show because I hate this kind of music, but like you played, and we and I love you, and like even my boyfriend likes you, and so we're going to listen to your stuff. <laughs> so to tie it into marketing and, and business, you, I think a lot of people will find that when you are yourself, when you, you don't go with the flow, when you just – be who you are, let your business shine, let your personality shine through your business, you'll have a better reaction and you'll end up doing better as a business. So I hope that made sense. Yeah, I mean, obviously I know, I mean, I've seen other bands do it. It's funny because, I mean, you may not know who they are, but there's this band, um, a local band here in Massachusetts called Prospect Hill. And uh, um, Isn't that familiar? Yeah, they, they, they've done some touring, but they're still fairly local, I want to say, to the Massachusetts area. But uh, it's funny because there was a show that came around, and they had all these heavy bands, and it was like this day-long thing where they rotate stages. And, you know, they just played this real, like, extra intense set, and, like, people were starting to, you know, they get into the mosh pit, and they get all crazy, at, you know, of course, to these heavier bands. And I, I remember my one of my good friends, He he's a drummer in another local band, and I'm there hanging out with him at the show, and people started moshing at the beginning of one of their songs. Like, they got it all, like, riled up at the beginning, and then it calmed down, like, to their normal pace. <laughs> you know, it was like the mosh pit started, and my friend looks at me, he says, he says, mosh pit to Prospect Hill. He was so confused, and it was like everyone had this expectation because they're so used to all the other bands that have been playing that day. That's funny. Now, what what part of Massachusetts are you in? I live in uh, a town called Methuen. Okay. Where is it near? Would, anywhere I would know? Um, I'm about an hour from Worcester. So if you've ever played, you may or may not have ever played a band, uh, a, band a venue called the Palladium. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so if you were, that tour could have very well gone. Like, where did you play in Mass when you were on the tour with Our Last Night, Elisana, and... Um, I don't think that tour went there. We played there with the Bled. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, we played there with the Bled, and I don't remember the other one. We've also played, we've played Boston a ton. Um, there was a, there's a record label based out of Boston um, called Red Blue. Yeah. Does that sound familiar? Red Blue Records. Not a um, but... They've got a band called Ice Nine Kills. That's kind of their oh, yeah. thing. And <laughs> and the guy, the this I hope he never listens to this, but the the owner is such a douchebag. Um, the owner of the label, and he would always book us for these festivals, and literally we'd be the only pop band. There would be twenty five metalcore bands, and then us. And uh, but we were really good friends with Ice Nine Kills. We did some touring with them. Um, and so they would always we'd play like two bands before them, but they would always be telling all their fans like, "Oh, go watch Honor Bright, like their pop music, but you'd like them." And it was really fun. The connections that we made were so weird, and I think that yeah. might be why we never we never got further than you know the record deal and then the first record flop on the record label. Um, I think because of that, because we were just totally out of our element the whole time, and we loved it. I mean, it reflected when we played with the pop bands. Everybody was kind of like, "Wow, that's a really intense like pop punk band." 
but uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. It's it's funny. They say you know obviously they say the you're the average of the five people you you spend the most time with, and we were the average of like the the hundred metalcore bands that we spent the most time with. <laughs> so it'd be like pop punk band that that throws their guitars around and like freaks out their entire set. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and that's interesting. I mean, I see like there's because I, I go to shows very commonly. I mean. Um, I'm I'm a concert junkie. I'll I'll go to concerts even by myself because I don't want to miss these bands. Mm-hmm. Um, even one of my favorite bands, they just broke up, and I'm I'm actually a little bummed out because they didn't come through Mass, and I couldn't get the day off work. I was even willing to drive three hours to go see them for their final like farewell tour. Ah, uh, bummer. Um, but you know, a band called Bleeding Through. You might not know who they are, but oh yeah, that's that's old school stuff. I like yeah, Bleeding they're Through. Like, like they're kind of like years the, ago. Yeah, the, exactly. They're like they're like my introduction to this band. The, oh you know, yeah, this kind of sound that that, that band and uh, another band called Eighteen Visions. Oh my God, Eighteen Visions. That brings me back when they came through Syracuse. Remember on a tour about ten years ago, they used to cut kids' hair because they <laughs> they were like they called themselves fashion core. So they used to like, <laughs> yeah. they would cut kids' hair like everybody would have the long swoop hair over their face and. The you know the singer used to wear like pink suits and stuff. Yeah. yeah, that that was that was some crazy times. Oh my god. Yeah, that's like really where it all started for me. Cause you, you I th- I read on your on your about page that you're 29. I'm 28. So yeah, I'm in, like, right around same, that same time. Yeah, like I just remember you know having this girl come to me in college. I was probably like 2004 maybe, mm-hmm. 2003 something like that. This girl. Um, you know, introduced me to like 18 Visions, and I remember buying a T-shirt at Hot Topic for like cheap, you know, five dollars or something. Yeah. And she took me to the show to see a band called Remembering Never. Mm, doesn't sound familiar. Yeah, they're kind of they were super underground at the time, and they had another band. I think um, I I can't remember offhand, but I mean, I I just ended up getting really into this music. At, at first, I I hated it. I couldn't stand like the screaming and the the craziness, but eventually, it's sort of like bands like Bleeding Through just sort of like um, had this um, they just sort of like like uh, over time I just sort of got used to it you know like I, I started to really like it and it, uh, it you know basically came to light with me where I was like I love this stuff and it was all I started listening to and that's why I started that Metalcore Kingdom site it was kind of it's funny because in a marketing sense I mean I'll, I'll take this back but if you look at um, you know like you said earlier all these bands you know people are struggling because they don't they don't people don't pay for music anymore and they download it online and you know I'm one of those people too I'll admit but um, if I had never downloaded all these all these bands and really like listen to their stuff I, I never would have been interested enough to go to their shows and pay for those tickets or buy their merchandise yeah we used to we used to tell people that to download our stuff we used to tell people to tour in our stuff before we got signed to the record label because obviously you know, we wanted to support our label but yeah, we used to tell people to support our stuff, to download our stuff, because we knew, and again, from a marketing standpoint, I'll, I'll relate this in a minute here, like, we knew that if people downloaded our record and they liked it, they would come to a show, so then we'd, you know, we'd obviously, we have Draw there, they'd buy our merch, so then we, that's where we made our money anyway, we didn't make that much money from, from CDs, and so we knew where our money really came from, which was merch, so we gave away the stuff, you know, hopefully we gave it away, some people bought it, but... Um, to, to get them in the door. So it's kind of along, along the lines of what a lot of people are doing with podcasting, what a lot of people are doing with their websites. The, the most amazing example of this, um, and, and I'll say if you want to start an internet business, give away as much as you can and then sell the, sell the actual getting it done. This, that's an amazing business model. Oh, an example of that is uh, Empire Flippers. Yeah. So they used to be called the AdSense Flippers. They're the Empire Flippers now. And what they do is they tell people from start to finish they have the most amazing ebook that you download for free. They tell you how to build a niche site, AdSense niche site empire. And it's simple. You know, they break it down step by step. You can do that or you can go to them and you can buy one of their sites that's already set up and ready to go. And a ton of people go and read their guide and they go, holy crap, this is a ridiculous amount of work. I'd rather just get the site that somebody's already set up. And then they make money from doing that. So that was kind of the same thing that we we told people download our record and then come to our show and if you like the music, you know, and people would do it, they download the record. We didn't make the, you know, 5 bucks or 10 bucks, but in reality it was really like a dollar. We didn't make the the tiny bit of money we would make from the record, but we made the money from them coming to the show and buying our merch. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's that's kind of like what it's all about. I mean, for me, I've always kind of had this thing where I like connecting with the bands and helping them as much as possible. You know, I'll go up to the singers or whoever like I'm really familiar with. Um, another band I know, like for example, I, I saw Our Last Night, who's a local band here. They're from New Hampshire. And yep. um, just saw them a week or two ago for their CD release. They put out like an EP album. And oh, another I didn't know band, they put out a new EP. I gotta get, I gotta check it out. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. They played a lot of new material. Um, but there was another band that's from Mass, and they've had you know some publicity. You may or may not know them. A band called Lions Lions. Uh, it doesn't sound familiar. No. Yeah, well, they um, you know, they're kind of more. I, I want to say they're probably a little bit more local to the area. So I don't know if they've quite got as good of a um, you know, their reach isn't quite there in terms of like if you were to compare them to like in our last night. Right. But, um, you know, I approach the lead singer and I'll say, hey, I have, you know, this website. Um, I have all your music videos on there. Let me know if you ever need any help with promotion. And um, I was able to kind of tie this in. I, I'll tie this into marketing. And, uh, you know, I don't want to talk too much about my own story, but just a real quick example um, from a social media perspective is I was able to reach out to someone who has a, um, a fan page on Facebook. It's called... Um, it's like new metal, hardcore, post-hardcore bands every day or something like that. Holy crap. And the guy has like 16,000 fans. Wow. So I reached out to him. I think he had 10,000 fans at the time. He's a really cool guy. You know, he'll post on his on his fan page like these really elaborate, like kind of opinionated posts. And he's very positive about all these bands. Like if you were to say, oh, you know, if you if you were to send him like, okay, I'm in the band Honor Bright, and I'd really love if you featured. You know, he'd probably write a little positive comment about it and what he likes about it or his opinion. You know, you know he was very um, writing very detailed posts when um, you know the lead singer of uh, Suicide Silence died. Um, oh back, yeah, 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 last a year ago. You know, so there was a lot of like in-depth posts he would write. So, anyways, I was able to kind of team up with him, and I put a um, I put a banner ad on my site for for that fan page for him to build his audience more when people visit my site. And in exchange, you know, he would send out emails for me and, um, you know, stuff to the fan page so he would be promoting the band. So it's easy for me, like, I could go out to these bands and help them in a way and kind of give back and then, you know, stand out a little bit more, not just be some some fan coming up and saying, I love your music, and then they never remember me. Right, yeah, you could actually kind of contribute something to them. And again, yeah. hey, you know what? Perfect. Let's tie this into business. So that's that's another thing. Let's say you you're in business and you want to reach out to an influencer or you want to get a meeting with somebody. The most amazing thing that you can do is to actually reach out and offer them something. You know, provide some value to them. Don't just say, you know, say I say, you know, I'm trying to reach out to John and I want John to sit down and have a coffee with me and tell me all about, you know, marketing. Um I'm not going to be like, hey, John, can we sit down and have a coffee? I want to learn from you. I'm going to be like, hey, John, you know, I, I help uh, podcasters. I actually produce podcasts for a living. Uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, to kind of check check out your podcast and see if there's any way that I could help you. Um, is there any part of your podcast you've been struggling with? And now I've got a relationship with John. Even if John comes back and says, you know what, uh, I don't need any help with my podcast. Thanks for offering. He's going to remember the guy that was like, you know, hey, I, I'd love to help you out. You know, no strings attached. So yeah. it's, you know, same thing. That's that's awesome that you did that, and and you built relationships with bands because you were able to offer them something that, you know, probably they wanted. Yeah, I mean, it's a real it's a real key, key thing, and I, I've I've actually I, I wrote a um, uh, I wrote an ebook about it, and I have it I have it for sale right now on my blog, um, basically about how I've kind of um, you know started these relationships, just like that example I write about it. In the uh, in the book, but how I was able to kind of form that, and then like the power of being able to do that in these connections, and um, I'll even give a recent example. It's not in my book, and it kind of pertains to um, the place that we met, the Podcasters Paradise. Is um, obviously I'm a you know I'm a fan of the Entrepreneur on Fire because John's podcast is huge for marketing. You know he's he's well known by um you know a lot of these people who are doing very well yeah. because he had a lot of them in his audience, and um, you know, I talked to John about his private membership originally a couple times, actually, uh, spread out. Um, I was interested, but it, it didn't really seem right for me in terms of, um, like, the financials. So I decided uh, against that. But then when he, you know, he mentioned he was launching this uh, this new membership specific for podcasts, um, you know, for podcasting, I was really excited, and I was like, well, this is perfect. You know, I wouldn't be, I'd be in a group of people that are doing, you know, it's very, very focused. So I... Um, I bought in on the early bird special, and 
I also decided, like recently with John, I, I emailed him before he even launched it, and I said, hey, I have a bunch of ideas. I have some tutorials I could make for you. For I'll do it for free. I, I didn't ask for anything. I just said, I have some tutorials I can make for you. You could put them in the membership area. So I actually made a tutorial on how to use Google Hangouts, and he, he put that right in the membership area. So all of, I think there's over 200 people in there. Wow, that's awesome. So, I mean, that's like if you go in the membership now, you know, it's, I'm basically now part of the part of the tutorials that he's got set up for teaching others, and he put my um, I didn't even ask for this, but he he gave me like a huge shout out in there. He at the end of the video, you know, he pops up my name and my blog website URL and everything. No, that's great. That's so, that's awesome. Again, great. you provided him value, and he was happy to you know provide it in return. Exactly, and then now I've got you know now I'm not just some dude to John, and then I'm I'm also working on um. Hopefully, I'm speaking with Kate, their editor, and I'm supposed to be having a guest post getting published pretty soon on the blog as well. Oh, that's great! Yeah, that's so fantastic. Like, you know, it's all about obviously in these cases. These are I'm helping I'm helping John and his community, and like you know, and that's really what it's all about. So if I were to ever go to John and say, "Hey, John, could you introduce me to such and such guests that you've had on in the past?" I'm sure he'd be happy to do it. You know. Right. Yeah, I don't see why he wouldn't. Right. He's you've provided him value in in many ways, and then. You know, it's like uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's got a new book coming out called Jab, 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 Right Hook. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you jab, you jab, you jab. And then when you go to ask for something, which is the right hook, then, of course, they're going to give it. Yeah. Now, I thought I'd ask just kind of while I was on the topic. Um, I know you have another podcast that you co-host with John. I mean, how, how did you get that arranged? Was that just something um, after – I mean, I didn't – I kind of looked at it when I, when I saw it. I was like, oh, he must – like my my immediate assumption was that you've known John for some time. <laughs> it's funny. Um, no, I I just was a fan of Entrepreneur on Fire, and uh, I had John on the awesome podcast twice. Actually, um, I had him. He was like my third guest ever, mm -hmm. and you know we just talked about stuff. He had just kind of started then, so he he still had a following. He had like a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand, I think. Uh, subscribers to his podcast and he was starting to get things going he was making a little bit of cash but he wasn't doing anything big the second time I had him on he was making 12 grand a month from podcasting and uh, he had like a few hundred thousand subscribers and we just kind of struck up a friendship we talked a lot um, you know bounced ideas off of each other for a few things and eventually um, he reached out and he said Tim I you know I want to start a podcast uh, as another podcast and I want it to be topical, and, and basically I just want it to be me and another person going back and forth talking about the struggles of being an entrepreneur and you know the mental game of it and how we can overcome that stuff. He goes, I'm a big fan of the awesome podcast and awesome clarity. I love what you're doing. I love your enthusiasm, and I see that you've recently kind of you know, left your, your job and you've gone full-time with your internet business. He goes, I would, I would love nothing more than to have you uh, co-host this show with me, and so... Of course, I jumped at the opportunity, being a big fan and just loving John's work in general. And we just uh, we just posted, I think it was episode number 12. Um, so we're 12 episodes in. It's a lot of fun. We tell some really personal stories. I, I've told some stuff on that show that I never thought I would tell just because... <laughs> You know, we play off of each other. I'll, I'll tell him a story about, you know, something that I did when I was in the band that helped me grow the band, and that'll trigger something in his mind of something he did when he was overseas in the military. And then that'll make me think of some emotion that I felt when I was starting this business. So, you know, it's really, it's a lot of fun, and, and John's an awesome guy. Um, it's definitely helped me build some notoriety. But uh, more than anything else, it's really it's a it's a passionate thing. We just love to talk to people. We love to help people through their struggles. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's really awesome. And I mean, it's basically kind of going on what what we were just talking about. You know, like you built that relationship with him, and here he is coming back and seeing. You know, he knows he knows you. He knows your story, so he comes back, and obviously, it's a huge opportunity for you. You know, now you're now you're basically co-hosting a podcast with one of the biggest. Um, you know, he's he's got one of the biggest marketing podcasts. Yeah, that's right. And I and I feel really truly blessed. Um, sometimes I think I, I try to play it off like like it's not you know this big deal. It is a big deal, and it's really awesome that you know he chose me. I was really flattered when he emailed me and and told me that he wanted me to do it. Um, and you know, the more that we do it, the more fun I'm having, and and it's almost like I kind of forget that this is a, a cool thing that's definitely helped my business. Um. You know, the my main I have three sources of income. One is coaching. I, I coach people on how to figure out what they want to do with their lives. 
Um, another one is I, I produce and edit podcasts for Authority Engine. And then the third thing, like I mentioned, is I do voiceover work. And since working with John uh, and doing Love Your Leap with him, he's hired me to do uh, the, the – I'm the voice of Entrepreneur on Fire. So when you hear the introduction, that's me, that I produce that and I do the voice. Um, and since then, I've actually landed several clients – as a result of working with John. So it's been really cool. It's, it's been a lot of fun. I, it's generated some income for me and done some cool things. And um, I think most importantly of all, I've really built a good friendship with John. And, and it's fun to hear people talk about uh, kind of how starstruck they are sometimes when they talk to him. And uh, to kind of have built such a friendship with him, whereas it's kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, John, yeah, he's a great guy. He's really cool. And, and I forget how massive Entrepreneur on Fire is sometimes until – you read the October income report and he made $100,000 and you go, okay, yep, I forgot, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it's funny because I was probably most nervous about my my interview that I did with Pat Flynn. Like, I was just really hesitant and, like, I built it up like this big thing and, you know, I, I try to, like, I feel like it really helps my confidence. Like, you know, if, if, obviously you haven't listened to my show, but I've had a guy that I interviewed, um, he was episode number eight, his name's Matt Allen. He, um, I interviewed him, and then we, we've been communicating, like, back and forth. We have, like, a similar relationship, like what you're describing, and he just helped me out with, um, you know, gave me a huge discount on a keyword research service that he has, and he went ahead and, like, did the work before, our, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, I, I did all this work, and he, you know, it's just really cool. Like, we have this great relationship, and he admits to me that I've improved so much over time because I've I've obviously, like, gotten used to this. You know, I, I interviewed um, Andrew Warner, and I had a fellow named Rick. Um, you know, he basically found me, found my podcast, and ended up listening to that show. And he was like, "I really liked your interview with Andrew." He's like, "I've seen other big name people interview him, and I enjoyed this more than any of those." And I was like, kind of blown away. And I don't really like. I, I I've actually personally like emailed Andrew multiple times back and forth. Like he's just like a regular guy. Like I'm not looking at him like oh my god, he's this god of interviews that's done 900 <laughs> interviews, you know. Right. Even though that's really the case, you know, I just, you know. And it's funny because he'll e email me back, like I, I think I sent him something, and I was like, Andrew, I made my first income from doing interviews, and um, here's an epic blog post that I wrote, and he's like, wow, that's awesome. You know, he's just really like, you know, very like normal and casual about it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's it's cool to it's definitely cool to build those connections, and it's one of the reasons why I love podcasting just so so much. It's one of the reasons why I got into podcasting as a business, and you know, I think the the fact that it's it's so awesome for people and for business is probably the reason why it, I'm able to support my family through podcasting. Just because it's amazing, it helps people be able to make connections to build a brand like never before. It's awesome. Podcasting is amazing. I, I love it. And anybody, you know, it's fun because I have this weird, um, I have this weird dichotomy of feelings about podcasting where half of me is like, God, I wish so many people would stop doing podcasts. But at the same time, that's not the real feeling. The real feeling is I love that so many people are doing podcasting. I just wish that people would, um, try to make it their own and do their own idea instead of doing everybody else's idea. Like, I love what you're doing. You talk to people about stuff that's not just a specific thing. You talk to people about their lives and how that relates to marketing. I love that. Um, you know, there's there's a podcast that came out recently called The Entrepreneur Showdown, and they interview entrepreneurs, but it's such a different spin on it because they kind of challenge them. And they bring up their articles or their podcast, and they say, you know, what about this? Like, what this is the other side of the coin. And that's yeah. so cool. I love that. So I'm loving this whole thing where people are just really making it their own. It's it's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's so much out there, and you know, I wish um I wish I knew more about the whole podcasting thing when I started because I was sadly unable to get into like the um the new and noteworthy, which obviously is like a huge takeoff for a lot of these people, like when they get started. But um, I'm I'm just I I figured my my kind of goal was you know if I if I stayed consistent you know, then that would be the biggest thing. And, you know, I, I've seen other people kind of come and go. I, I've seen, um, I emailed someone even recently because they had started this interview show and they had this crazy story about how they invested all this money into their business and just spent ludicrous amounts of money. And, um, into a podcast? Well, just everything that they were doing with marketing, oh, okay. like training, like they were taking one training course after another and just so much money into all this stuff. And they were hiring virtual assistants without any income. And it was just crazy. Yikes. Yeah, and I was, um, 
you know, they were kind of following the, you know, this whole thing, and they didn't know how to design the website themselves, so they paid someone. So it was just, I think they ended up spending something close to like twenty thousand dollars. Jeez, it was, all yeah, it was just this crazy thing. And I went back to her site recently, and um, she ended up like rebranding entirely and moved away from the interview show. But it was like she had this great like kind of concept going, and just sort of gave up on it. That's because she she didn't do it. I mean. You know, I think there's there's a lot to be said for both ways. You, you know, there's you can go two different sides of the spectrum. You've got John Lee Dumas and you've got me. Both of us are location independent entrepreneurs. Both of us are build have built internet businesses that support our family. So we don't, you know, we don't have to work a job or anything like that, right? Yeah. But two different ways to go about it. John makes you know between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars a month, and he invested every dime he had into his business when he started. He had a ton of money built up. He built an amazing studio. He spent tons of money on coaching. He spent tons of money on everything, and he built a big thing. And now he's big, right? I don't make nearly as much as John. Um, I haven't hit the six figure mark yet. I will, but I haven't. <laughs> and yeah. but I make you know I make a decent amount of money and plenty to support my family. Um, but I started with a total investment of maybe a hundred bucks. Uh, we're talking microphone. Uh, I used free recording software. I bought a five dollar pair of earbuds. I have a laptop that is it's a netbook. That's to tell you how easy it is to get started with you know, I, I can't even I'm trying to think of anything else that I might have spent money on. maybe some you know a couple of fiver gigs to get like a cover made and stuff like that. So, you really, it's so easy to get into business right now, which makes it hard too because everybody's getting into business and everybody's got a niche site and everybody's got a blog and everybody's got a podcast. But, you know, if you do it well and you take it seriously and you really, you just start and you just bust your booty, you can make some amazing things happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've just been working to build, you know, connections with as many people as possible and that seemed to be my biggest benefit because I was able to, get a gig writing for um, a magazine and submitting like one interview a month that I do. So each That's month awesome. I, I pick one interview and then I submit that. And um, yeah, I did, I did the one that that'll be my big one of the month and it's just finding the time to focus and sit down and write about it. And that's the, that's the challenge. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's it's definitely difficult, but you're passionate about it and you know, it's something that could do big things for you. So you, you do it and that's, that's great. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I figure we we got to be we've gone at least fifty minutes now. I think uh, I figure we'll wrap things up. My girlfriend was just doing the head poke, so <laughs> I know that feeling. I know yeah. that look. I know the sound of that. Even if it's silent, I know what it sounds like. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I uh, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to um, be on the show, and uh, I you know I I'm gonna keep I'm gonna follow uh, what you're doing with your shows. Probably leave you a review and check out some of the podcasts you have as well. Yeah, same for you. You've made a new fan in, in having me on the show. So thank you thank you for having me on and letting me tell a little different side of my story that I don't get to talk about too often. Yeah, no, it at least relates to something I'm familiar with. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, talk to you later, Tim. Thanks, John. Yep, bye.